Hey everybody, it's Barb from Making It Home. Today we are continuing our emergency preparedness series with how to store food for long-term storage. We're gonna show you a method that has been tested and tried and true. probably wondering where Aaron is well he's at work so we're gonna film the rest of this the DIY part of it or the project the wubba, when he gets home from work so he will be in this video I promise I know you all miss him well like I said today we're gonna be talking about how you can store bulk foods for long term what I mean by long term is anything over about five years. In our last video, we discussed the different methods that you would be using for like short term storage because canning, freeze drying, and dehydration are usually the methods you want to use if you're rotating the foods in your food supply. There is a little um, controversy about whether or not you should use long term food storage in your rotation, meaning you shouldn't be just setting and forgetting it because it's a waste of money a lot of people think. But I will tell you there are ways that you can actually do this bulk food storage and keep it rotated in your food supply. The first thing we need to talk about is what kind of foods do you want to be storing long term and what kind of foods do you not want to be storing long term. Long term food storage is generally better for items that are low moisture. So we're looking at grains, um, baking items like salt, sugar, baking soda, and then of course the old standbys, beans and rice. I don't recommend putting flour into long-term storage because in the flour there are certain things that can be in the flour that we're not aware of because we use it so quickly. It's just gross, but there can be bug eggs in your flour. And we don't notice them because we use it, we cook it, it kills them. It doesn't matter. But if you're storing long term, it gives them a chance to hatch. Ugh. If you want to store an alternative to flour long term, I suggest getting wheat berries and a grinder. It's a much better method, it lasts longer, it stays fresh, it works better. If you are storing flour for more than six months, one of the recommended things you can do is take your bags of flour and store them in the freezer for a couple of days. That will kill off any bugs or anything that's growing or whatever in there. I know it sounds gross, sorry. Erin and I don't store flour long term anymore. Like I don't purchase any more than 15 pounds at a time I use a lot of flour for just the two of us because I have a sourdough starter and I have to feed it every day so it gets really tedious having to buy a five pound bag of flour every freaking week. The items that you're going to need to do this project are oxygen absorbers, mylar bags, and the food grade buckets. You can get the food grade buckets from, I have heard, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but most of the time you can go to grocery store bakeries and ask them for their old frosting containers. They usually get their frosting delivered in five gallon buckets, which of course are food grade. I don't recommend using any other kind of bucket because you just don't know if where it's been, what it's been used for. You don't want to be using cat food buckets. I've seen people do this. Not a good idea. It's just not meant for that type of storage. The Things you have to think about when you're storing food long term are the enemies of food. This is going to determine where you store your food and how. The enemies of long term food storage are oxygen, light, heat, moisture, pests, and time. So this is why we use this method for storing food. I will be providing links down below in the description box for you to get the different items that you need to do this project. I'm also going to be posting a link to one of our blog posts that tells you which types of foods are best for long-term storage and which aren't. The rule of thumb with a lot of this stuff is like with the oxygen absorbers, the rule of thumb is 
300 cc's for each gallon. With a five gallon bucket, you're looking at 1500 cc's of oxygen absorbers. The ones I have here, I believe are 1200 cc's, so we usually throw in one of these and then a 300 cc. And you'll notice that I have them in a canning jar. The reason for that is when you get your oxygen absorbers, they come in a bag that you can't reseal. I just discovered a little trick. You can put them in a canning jar, put the lid on, and you can tell it's sealed. I also throw in the little indicator that comes with the bag of oxygen absorbers and on it you'll see, I don't know if you can see this, it's pink, yeah, on it it's pink and that means it is still good. It's in a low oxygen environment. If this were to turn purple or blue, I'd know that its oxygen absorbers are no longer good. So that's just a little tip. And you're going to notice in our little demonstration that Erin and I use a household iron to seal our mylar bags. We have a little piece of wood to iron it on. And that's because I'd rather do that than iron it on my dining room table. A trick to that that's even better, if you don't have a commercial sealer at home, you can go to the secondhand store or Walmart or Kmart or wherever and get yourself a very cheap flat iron. Make sure that the flat iron you get has a way to adjust the temperature because learn from our mistakes. We actually used my expensive flat iron that does not have a temperature adjustment on it and the more expensive flat irons run really hot. So yeah, it was kind of a mess. Thank goodness we figured it out real soon. It basically melted the bag onto my flat iron. Thank goodness it solidified when I let it cool and I was able to get it off. But yeah, I almost ruined my $100 flat iron. I don't recommend that. So what setting should you be using? With Mylar bags, it can depend on the thickness of them. I always say start out low and go high. Do not start on the highest setting or you'll end up with a mess like we did. I looked it up and with most Mylar bags, it says that they seal at around 300 degrees. So I would start with 300 and if it doesn't seal, go up from there. It's better to have a nothing seal and then figure out what the temperature should be set at then to start out by melting the bag. So those are my little tips. So let's get on with the demonstration. Aaron's going to help me out with this demonstration, even though he's been working all day long. <laughs> It really is kind of a two-person job because it can get a little awkward and a pain in the butt to try and hold open the Mylar bag while you're pouring this giant bag of food into it. I do recommend having a buddy. Yeah, that does make it easier. <laughs> so we're gonna show you the process how to do it. And like I said earlier in the video, because we're using a five gallon bucket, we are going to be using 1500 cc's of oxygen absorbers. We only have a 1200 and a 300, so that works. So we're gonna throw those in there too. So let's show you how we do this with, like I said, an iron. All right, so we have our five gallon food grade bucket. Aaron's going to get the Mylar bag. We have the five gallon Mylar bags. So shiny. <laughs> you get your Mylar bag and you open it up, put it down into the bucket. And then you just crawl inside and you let somebody seal you up. <laughs> so what we're putting into our bucket, our bucket <laughs> is split green peas that we picked up at Winco. I believe I only paid 12 bucks for these, this 25 pound bag of split green peas. So we're gonna go ahead and Erin somehow magically figured out how to open the bag. I can never get it, so I always recommend using some scissors. And this is the part where a friend comes in handy. And you want to shake it to try and get the whatever you're putting in the bag to fit in the bottom of the bucket. So this is what it looks like when you get it kind of settled and shook down into there. 
And now we're going to be moving on to the next step. When you get a new pack of oxygen absorbers, like we have here, like I said, it's not resealable, so we're going to put it in the canning jar like I explained earlier. I also pointed out that we use that little eye indicator and I put it in the jar so that I know that the oxygen absorbers are still good. This part you kind of want to be a little quick about. So you get out your oxygen absorber and you put them in your jar, all the ones you're not going to be using. So we're going to be using one. one 300 milligram oxygen absorber and then we're going to be adding to that a 1200 milligram. 1200 milligram oxygen absorber and that totals 1500. So now that we put the oxygen absorbers in there, we're going to get ready to seal it. And you want to try and push as much air out of it as you can. You don't have to be perfect. And this is what I was talking about earlier about how we uh, use this little board. It helps so that I have a surface to seal this on. Taking a second. See, there goes the can. And you just slowly kind of go along and you'll see it wrinkle up and that lets you know that it's sealing. Okay, you can speed up. And you just kind of go back over and make sure you got all parts of it. And that should be good. And if it doesn't seal, we usually leave these without the lid. I mean, we can place the lid on it. And here's the lid I was talking about earlier. This is not a gamma lid. This is just a regular large gasket lid. Mm -hmm. And it has this little pull tab. So when you're ready to use it, you just pull that off. We leave these overnight so that we can tell if it gets properly sealed. And you'll know by the next day it will suction to the food and then if it hasn't been sealed properly, it won't. And then we'll figure out if we didn't get a proper seal and then we can go through and try it again. And we just have to use new op oxygen absorbers. So we just tuck it back down and to keep our caps out of it, we just kind of set the lid lightly on top. After we've checked it and it's properly sealed, we then take a rubber mallet or you know a hammer with a towel or something over the edge and make sure that it seals tight and then you put it in the storage area I spoke about making sure that it's not going to have any extreme temperature changes moisture or anything like that and anything you want to add nope just make sure that you label it and before you go reaching your hands in the mylar bags to spread it out and put the your food in it make sure you wash, wash your, hands. your hands yes Sanitation, it's always a good idea. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope you enjoyed this demonstration and you learn how to start your own long-term food storage. If you have any questions or suggestions, please put them in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. If you like these types of videos, don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell so you always know when we have a new video up. We put out videos once a week on how you can nurture a simpler, happier, healthier home. This is going to help determine where you, where you, bleh. this is going to, here's a little piece of advice. When you make a YouTube video, you really should hit record on the dang camera. Rookie mistake. Holy crud. Now I get to do all this all over again. <sighs> oh my gosh. I drink, need a drink. Oh wait. Too late. Oh, <clears throat> Are you done? Bye, y'all.